red and yellow and pink and green, purple and orange and blue. I can sing a rainbow, sing a rainbow, sing a rainbow too. Go. Uh, confession. Little kids kind of terrify me. Um, I've taught college classes, I've taught high school, I've taught middle school, but the idea of teaching a room full of five-year-olds just kind of gives me the chills. Except when I'm teaching abstraction. Little kids aren't judgmental yet. If I ask them to tell me what they see in an abstract painting, they'll just say it's a black squiggle or a, a blue blob or a finger or an angel or an eyelash. Ask the average teenager what they see, you'll get crickets. So let's go back to kindergarten and just take a look at Kandinsky's Improvisation 28, version two from 1912. Welcome to Art History Unscripted. Before we start analyzing the formal characteristics of this, let's talk about the difference between form and content because we'll be doing both. When we're talking about form, we're talking about only the visual characteristics, just what we're looking at, just line, shape, value, color, texture, space, and then principles of art like balance and unity, things like that, okay? In terms of content, we'll get to that in a little bit. So when looking at the formal qualities of this piece, the thing that strikes me first are the bold black lines that Kandinsky is using. They help guide us through the composition. He's also using patches of very um, intense, unmixed colors that compete for our attention, creating a sense of rhythm and movement. If we look at the shapes that he's using, they're mostly organic shapes. They're shapes that we would find in nature, and they're mostly gentle and soothing. They're made up of curved lines. And there's a tension that he's created as well. And he's doing it by juxtaposing vertical lines with horizontal lines, bold, uh, um, bold thick lines with thinner and delicate lines, and by using warm and cool colors near each other in the composition. But the end result is one that's really balanced and cohesive. For those of you that are new to looking at art, always start with this process. Start with line, shape and color, slow down, look closely and avoid judgment and embrace your inner child. Works of art are easy to get when the purpose is straightforward. Maybe it's trying to glorify a ruler or tell a story, but what do we do when an artist is trying to reach our soul? What's our reaction supposed to be? How do we know what the artist wants us to feel? Am I getting it? Am I doing this right? Let's relax and make some sense of this with three S's. Spirituality, synesthesia, and Schoenberg. Kandinsky actually wrote a book called Concerning the Spiritual in Art, where he tried to express what he wanted his paintings to accomplish and what does it mean to be spiritual? Well. Let's not overthink it. Let's just look at the root of that word, which is spirit. Like all of us have a, an inner spirit or a soul, and Kandinsky is simply trying to express that inner spirit in his works of art. Now, synesthesia is something else entirely. Synesthesia is when a person can have senses that overlap. So um, maybe you can smell sound, or maybe you can taste color. If that seems ridiculous, well, just bear with me for a second. Um, when you're served a plate of food um, and it arrives and you look at that plate of food and it's got this beautiful aroma coming off of that, that aroma is contributing to the way it's gonna taste in a minute. Um, and what about the color of that food? If you're served a plate of food and all of that food is gray, it's probably not going to taste the same. Um, how about that green ketchup that Heinz promoted for a little while? Why wasn't it popular? Because we expect ketchup to be red because it's made out of tomato. So the color of the ketchup is going to affect how that ketchup tastes. So if you're skeptical about this whole synesthesia, sensory overlap thing, how about we try this? You got a pen handy, you can draw it. If you don't, that's fine, just play along. If I ring a bell, a ah, high note, kind of crisp, um, if, I, if I was forced to draw that, 
um, I would probably pick up a bright color, a sunny color, a red, um, maybe a yellow. Uh, I would probably make um, a small or a small dot, or maybe if I was going to make a line, it would be a thin line. All right, sound about right. Now, how about this? Get my bongo and let's give this a tap. Okay, now we're gonna imagine, what does that sound like? This is big, this is bold. This is gonna be a blue color, maybe like a dark purple. And if I'm gonna draw a dot, that's gonna be a big, heavy, thick dot, or if it's gonna be a line, again, it's gonna be big, boom. Our third S is Schoenberg, as in Arnold Schoenberg, who was a music theorist, he was a composer, he was a teacher, even an artist, and he was famous for making atonal music, even though he didn't like the name atonal music. Um, this is a kind of music that lacks traditional keys or tonal structures, much like an abstract painting that lacks subject matter. If this doesn't make sense, and I'm not a music theorist, imagine, um, how about a bird singing? Um, would we all agree that that is music? Well, even though we, birds are singing, they're not singing in any particular key, and they're not singing with any particular time structure, but we would still understand that as music. And Vasily Kandinsky listened to music while he painted, and he improvised in his paintings while he heard the music being um, improvised. So they were feeding off of each other. He was trying to make paintings that were directly influenced by and sounded like the music he was hearing. Still skeptical about all of this? Well, musicians agree that the ultimate expression of your virtuosity is the ability to improvise, to be so in sync with your instrument that the music just pours out of you without any preconception. Athletes do the same thing, they call it flow. I'm an avid mountain biker, and when I'm at my best, the bike and the trail and my body all synchronize. So I'm not thinking about the break in foot or the gear selection or how it might hurt if I hit that tree. I'm improvising. My unconscious mind is using prior experience to allow me to just let it rip. And this is what Kandinsky is trying to do in his painting, and also how he's hoping that we respond. If you're taking AP art history, you need to be comfortable with the phrase iconographical program. You'll see this on the exam about 87 times. Iconographical program is art speak for what's in the picture and what does it mean? In other words, what's the subject matter and what does it symbolize? Good news. This painting doesn't really have an iconographical program. Bad news. Your brain and college board kind of wants it to. When you're looking at this painting, before you start saying, ooh, ooh, I see eyeballs, or I see butt cheeks, just, just wait. Kandinsky wants you to feel the color in the line. You don't have to play detective and decode what this painting is about. Kandinsky evolved into this style. His earlier works were more kind of post-impressionistic or Fauvist inspired. Improvisation 28 still has some recognizable subject matter. And as he got older and more confident, it disappeared entirely, um, became one of the first non-objective paintings. Non-objective is, our, again, art speak for there's no subject matter in it whatsoever that reflects anything in the real world. It's just lines, it's just shape, it's just color. So, the next time you read the words iconographical program in an essay prompt, exhale, relax, this is just art nerd speak for what's in the picture and what's it supposed to mean. You can relax even more when looking at an abstract painting because your job as a viewer is easy. You can't have a wrong answer. Just look at it. What do you see? If you can accurately describe what you're seeing using some basic art terminology, you're right. Art historians love to categorize, especially when it comes to modern art movements and the 
isms that we've got. So if you like isms, you can call this painting Expressionism or German Expressionism. If you want to practice your fake German, you can call it, call it the Die Blaue Reiter, or in English, the Blue Rider. Speaking of color, let's get into why blue, because this group is called the Blue Rider. The main reason for the blue is straightforward. Kandinsky and his partner Franz Marc thought blue were the most spiritual colors. Um, they just loved blue. Now here's where we get a little theoretical. Animals are pure. What does that mean? Well, human beings are, by their nature, are corrupted, meaning uh, society is going to cause them to do things that are either right or wrong based on our own standards. Animals are operating in a con completely different spectrum where they're just expressing their animalness. And this is the kind of thing that Kandinsky and, and Mark were really drawn to. You can think of this as being an outgrowth of that interest in primitivism that we've talked about with other modern art groups, where they're looking to other cultures, whether they are African cultures or indigenous cultures, seeing those cultures being closer to nature. Well, if you take that to the next level, what's closer to nature than an animal? Animals are in nature, animals are nature. So Kandinsky was born in Russia. But he moved to Germany and became a German citizen, and along with Paul Klee founded this group, which, like the other German Expressionist group, Die Brücke, didn't last terribly long. And like a lot of other modern painters, uh, after World War II and the rise of the Nazi party, he left Germany. Um, but he didn't come to the United States. Kandinsky actually went to Paris and eventually became a French citizen and stayed there. Now, historians love a famous verse. Um, they love to trace things back to their origins and find out where things began. And a lot of them like to credit Kandinsky for being the first non-objective painter or the first abstract painter. I'm not going to go that far. I mean, he's certainly a pioneer of abstraction, but there were so many people kind of working their way toward abstraction at the same time that I don't want to give credit to anyone for being the first. But if you ever say that in an essay or in conversation, you're not necessarily wrong. But I do want to talk about two words, continuity and change. If you are an AP Art History student, those terms come up a lot. And they have to do with um, whether or not a work of art is fitting within a tradition or whether or not it's creating a new tradition. And I'll propose that Kandinsky is kind of doing both. So how is this showing continuity at all? Well, if you look back at earlier Kandinsky paintings, he's working within a landscape tradition. That's certainly conventional. Um, if you look at earlier Kandinsky paintings, he's definitely inspired by landscapes like Cezanne and the Post-Impressionists. He certainly has some affinity for Fauvist uh, like color compositions. Um, so he's certainly working within continuity of modern art movements. Now change, I think change is where we really have to appreciate Kandinsky. Without artists like Kandinsky or without Kandinsky himself, I'm not sure that we would have abstract expressionism in the United States in the 1940s and into the 1950s. He was one of the artists that all of those abstract expressionists look to, whether it's Jackson Pollock, or it's Willem de Kooning, later Helen Frankenthaler. They saw Kandinsky as their touchstone uh, of abstraction. So we need to keep that in mind, that he was interested in not just abstraction, but um, expressing an inner spirit and doing it through color, through line, through movement. So it begins with him. Still skeptical about all of this uh, spirituality and abstraction? Well, the next time you look at a work of art that baffles you or disturbs you, before rushing to judgment, consider what the artist was trying to accomplish. Just keep in mind that art isn't just be about being pretty. Just as there are sad songs and upbeat songs, ballads and instrumentals. In fact, think of all the different playlists most people create. Ones for working out, others for falling asleep. Most people accept that music comes in lots of styles. And there's music that can make us laugh or get us psyched up for a workout or even bring us to tears. But sometimes we look at unfamiliar art and immediately resort to, I don't get it or I don't like it. So if you're still struggling with abstract art, Check out the case for abstraction on the Art Assignment channel. It's a great video. Still not sure if you like abstract art? Good. I recommend that you take your own ego and personal preferences out of this art historical equation. 
As soon as you make up your mind about something, you really stop thinking about it. So now that you've decided to not be, a, not be judgmental, make sure you give this video a thumbs up and subscribe. Thanks for watching. Awesome. filming, just so you know.